Welcome to Trial Site News podcast series. Today, we are excited to have Teresa Deicher with us on the program. Now, she has a PhD in molecular and cellular physiology, as well as an undergrad in biology at Stanford. Now, for our show today, we'll be discussing her company, AVM Biotechnology, and the supercharging of the body's own natural immune response, a potential solution to global pandemics, no option cancers, and autoimmunity. So, Teresa, welcome. Thank you. Very nice to be here. The pleasure is ours. So before we deep dive into the topic at hand, just kind of give our audience a little bit of a get to know you. Uh, Could you tell us how did you end up taking the academic route? Well, I uh, studied at Stanford, as you mentioned, and then I did a postdoctoral fellowship in hematology at the University of Washington. And other than that, I have been in the pharmaceutical industry uh, my entire career. I was with uh, Genentech. A company named Repligen in Boston, and then Zymogenetics and Immunex. And then Immunex was purchased by Amgen uh, prior to founding AVM Biotechnology. Oh, wow. Now, as you mentioned, we know that you spent well over a decade as a senior scientist in a number of different biotechs, and you mentioned Genentech and a few others. What did you learn along the way that prepared you to become an executive and scientific entrepreneur in the world of biotech? Well, in in my career in the pharmaceutical industry, I've been able to do the most basic discovery research, as well as working um, in clinical trials. And I would say, you know, particularly my experience at Immunex and Amgen, where I led uh, clinical development programs, uh, really prepared me to found my own company and uh, take our lead drug um, into clinic and and eventually to the market. So seamless integration uh, is a theme that you hear uh, in many companies, and that was a theme at Immunex as well as Amgen. And so as my programs moved into clinical development, I had the uh, blessing to work with, uh, you know, the commercial departments, the marketing departments, as well as all of the clinical development divisions and learn from, you know, people who were incredibly successful in their fields. Now, we know that you have accumulated considerable knowledge involving immunotherapy and oncology, as well as working with viruses and regenerative therapies. Can you share how these interests unfolded high level and what key decisions led you towards certain scientific pursuits over others? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's actually been an interesting uh, road to follow Um, the, the, our lead drug, uh, which we're taking into clinic in relapsed refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, as well as to treat acute respiratory distress syndrome, whether it's caused by uh, COVID-19 or influenza. And I'm a very data-driven person. Uh, I like to approach things without putting uh, uh, preconceived notions or blinders on them and just really look at the raw data and the hard data and let that drive um, our decisions as well as our business and clinical strategy. So when we were first working with our lead drug, we were using lower concentrations and we were uh, interested in replacing chemotherapy preconditioning that's required prior to cell therapy for optimal results. And as we took our compound up to higher doses in our models, um, what became apparent was that uh, very exciting, intriguing immune cells were mobilized by our molecule. Uh, One of those is called a natural killer T cell. And this cell bridges the rapid or innate immunity with the adaptive or the long-term immunity. And natural killer T cells are programmed uh, by nature to kill abnormal cells. And so with this data, uh, we realized that we have really a platform technology that could be applied to multiple cancers, multiple infectious diseases, and, you know, theoretically be a response 
to future pandemics without the need to develop new drugs every time a new virus springs up in the world. Um, so let's talk then about regenerative therapies, including stem cell based therapies. And it's a rapidly unfolding science area for therapies. Can you share more about what could be a revolution in healthcare, the incredible promise, but also the risks and how to balance what is ultimately the best for society? So cell therapy in regenerative medicine, in immuno-oncology, does hold great promise. Um, and in order for that promise to be realized, uh, we have to understand how cells move through the body. And that was the focus of AVM biotechnology. Uh, we understood that through our research. We identified hurdles that had to be solved for cell therapy to have optimal effects. And we developed our lead drug that would ensure that cell therapies would actually get to the site they needed to get to in order to cause regeneration. Um, and that was our, our first uh, uh, focus. Um, we, we have sort of backburnered that as we realized that we could be a standalone uh, mobilizing these novel immune cells to treat cancer and infectious disease. But we have some compassionate use going on uh, where we precondition patients before cell therapies and, able, and, uh, and see really exciting results. Um, We've done some work in non-healing wounds uh, very successfully. Um, and you know, particularly the, uh, many people face amputation uh, with these non-healing wounds where we've been able to precondition and then um, allow platelet and cell therapy to successfully you know, heal these wounds. So some really exciting compassionate use data in that area. So what about AVM biotechnology? Now, we know you launched it in 2008. What was the impetus to start the company? How did it come together to become more entrepreneurial? So um, I launched the company um, leaving Anjan uh, with some reorganizations that were going on and um, really not having a desire to relocate away from the Seattle area. Um, at Amgen, uh, we were interested in optimizing cell therapy for regenerative medicine. We were not successful in fully understanding cell movement through the body and in the biology of this. And so I just took uh, what I had learned and brought it to ABM. Uh, and we, we used old-fashioned biology in the lab which allowed us to actually understand and learn how cell movement through the body is controlled. Whereas, you know, many of the large pharma companies, very cash heavy, uh, use nanotechnology approaches that just aren't applicable uh, when we're really looking at a cellular level uh, rather than a, a micro or a nano level. Now, for other bioscience entrepreneurs and executives listening, can you share what you think has been a success with a company and, and also what have been some lessons learned? So we are a privately held company, and our success is, is really from the constant support and dedication of our investors. Uh, we have a significant number of investors who are doctors, who are MDs, and we have a significant number of investors who have came, come in repeatedly. And so I think our success is just based on the faith of our investors who have supported us through this point where we're actually now treating, treating patients and realizing um, the promise of our therapy. So that investor base is really critical to entrepreneurs, their trust, their faith, their support. Right, absolutely. And, and we can also see now, too, that biology and science, it's, which is obviously an incredibly important topic for many people today, as opposed to perhaps even a few years ago, with the onset of the pandemic, trial site news, for example, experienced massive growth in traffic as more and more 
people are interested in the science of research, but also the business research. Can you share how your first feelings and thoughts were as you heard about this pandemic unfolding in Wuhan, China? Did you anticipate the magnitude of this crisis? So as the um, pandemic began to unfold, we were heavily focused on getting FDA approval for our terminal no option lymphoma patients, as well as filing uh, multiple patents to make sure that we are protecting our intellectual property and protecting the company. Um, in our patent filings, we uh, had always been interested in infectious disease we actually had thought that HIV would be our first clinical indication in the infectious disease area. And we feel that we can have a significant impact on um, HIV eliminating the reservoirs uh, where HIV likes to hide in the human body. So on March 13th, we filed um, our full uh, investigational new drug application with the FDA for lymphoma, and uh, within two weeks, we had actually filed, written brand new documents focused on the COVID-19. So recognizing the seriousness of the pandemic, the lack of um, potential treatments and drugs for that, we just immediately turned, you know, to answer that call, um, particularly because <coughs> our approach mobilizing the body's own naturally programmed killer T cells um, uh, eliminates, um, you know, a lot of the uncertainties that are out there for all of the other approaches. So um, no vaccine has ever been developed against a coronavirus. And so, you know, the likelihood of a successful vaccine is not guaranteed um, whatsoever against the COVID-19. Antivirals have their own uh, issues, resistance develops, they have toxicities and side effects. Whereas, you know, mobilizing the body's own immune cells um, is a, a, a non-toxic and a very effective way uh, to combat disease. And then additionally, we're particularly excited because these natural killer T cells by nature kill abnormal cells. And so, for instance, COVID-21 may arise, and in which case entirely new vaccines and antivirals will have to be developed, whereas our drug can mobilize the body's own immune cells that can combat COVID-21 or 23 without requiring a whole new development um, process. So it's a response to the situation now, and it's a response to future global pandemics. The world just cannot shut down like this every time a new virus springs up. We have to be prepared with a drug like ABM Biotechnology's lead drug to go and stop that pandemic immediately where, or not the pandemic, stop that virus immediately so that it does not turn into another global pandemic. Right. So what then was the moment that you came to the conclusion that AV biotechnology had the right investigational product to address SARS-CoV-2? Well, um, it was really uh, working with uh, one of my outside consultants and advisors. And in the patents, we had always planned on infectious disease, um, and uh, we finished filing all of our lymphoma documents, and he just turned to me and said, yeah, you know, um, our drug uh, could treat the COVID-19. Uh, we should get those documents going, and the light bulb went on. We had patented the use of our technology against coronaviruses, and it was like, you're right, Okay, we've been so focused on lymphoma, we have that going, you're right, we need to step up and we're just going to do the hard work and we're going to work so hard and so many hours and we're going to be ready uh, as soon as we can to take this into clinic against COVID-19, uh, which we have done. So it was an outside advisor who just reminded me um, 
these immune cells can combat infectious disease and COVID-19 is an infectious disease. So then can you share what the AVM biotechnology strategy is for developing treatments that alleviate human suffering of COVID-19 patients? So uh, we are d- developing a novel formulation of an approved active pharmaceutical ingredient. And our novel formulation allows this drug to be administered safely in just one one hour intravenous infusion to give a total dose that typically you know, requires uh, weeks if not longer, we can give this total dose safely and effectively. And the active pharmaceutical ingredient has been shown, given at low doses daily, to reduce mortality in moderately to severely ill COVID-19 patients. But they're still in the hospital for weeks. They suffer um, very serious lung damage that can take years to recover from. What we can do is give that effective dose immediately. And we see onset of benefit within six to 48 hours. Oh, wow. So we hypothesize we can take hospitalization stays down to, you know, three to four days. That's a significant benefit to the infrastructure, the financial costs of this. And by rapidly eliminating the immune cells that cause the lung damage, we can prevent that um, long-term lung pathology, um, you know, from occurring and basically improve quality of life when these people are discharged from the hospital. Which is also a really big deal. It, It is. It's a really big deal. And people who suffer from acute respiratory distress syndrome who survive, it's sometimes one to five years for full recovery. Quality of life is diminished. Um, and we, we really want to make an impact on that. We want to get these patients out of the hospital, but we want to get them out of the hospital with preserved lung function. And we believe that we can do that. So let's talk then about AVM0703. As a novel patent pending formulation of a repurposed drug without the toxic excipients, unlike existing formulations, AVM0703 has an anti-tumor activity in a immunocompetent mouse model of B-cell lymphoma, or A20, as both a standalone treatment and in combinations with current therapeutics. Would this be a d- correct description? Uh, yes, absolutely. So AVM0703 is our lead molecule, and we are developing it. Um, it can be used by treating physicians at their decision on how they want to medically manage their patient. It can be used by itself where it has effectiveness. It can be used in combination with chemotherapy where it can significantly lower the dose and the toxicity of the chemotherapy. It can be used in combination with cell therapies and it can be used in combinations with other immunomodulatory drugs. And so that allows the physician to tailor treatment to each patient. And the doctor knows their patients best. They have a feeling for what they will respond to, what they won't respond to. And we feel really personalizes the treatment for that patient. You know, rather than coming in uh, with a new drug and uh, dictating to the doctor and the patient what will be done, forcing them onto a long-term clinical trial. Um, Our uh, response is uh, very rapid. And within 72 hours, the physician and the patient will know, did they have a complete response? Uh, If not, they can add other therapies. And so ultimately, you know, we want to tailor this so that it's right for each patient. Now, we are aware of two potential clinical trials involving AVM0703, including one addressing leukemia or or lymphoma called the WORD study, and another phase one and phase two study of course targeting COVID-19. Can you share the progress of these clinical trials? What are the primary endpoints and what would be the ideal outcome? 
Right. So in the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, where we're, uh, we're enrolling no option patients, so relapsed refractory patients who have failed all other treatments, um, you know, the primary endpoints will be safety and uh, a response. So overall response, complete response, progression-free survival. And uh, we actually project from compassionate care information that we have compassionate use uh, using our drug uh, in patients, um, not under regulated clinical trials, but on a compassionate basis, that we anticipate seeing um, about a 50% uh, complete response rate. Oh, wow. So um, we are uh, currently um, enrolling that trial, uh, finalizing our site enrollment. COVID-19 set us back a little bit because cancer trials were put on hold, uh, but they're opening up again. And if people uh, are interested in finding out uh, where they could participate in a clinical trial, they can go to our website, www.avmbiotech.com and fill out a request form and um, we can connect them with a clinical trial site. Um, this is an open label, meaning everyone in that trial will receive active drug. So no one will receive placebo. Uh, if patients um, cannot uh, access a clinical trial site for whatever reason, geography or uh, uh, other reasons, uh, their doctor can apply for compassionate use. And we do supply the drug free of charge for compassionate use. Uh, we work with the FDA and um, get their approval for each individual patient, but they've been very supportive and we've been able to get approval uh, within 24 hours. Fantastic. So if they can't be in a clinical trial, they can still access the drug. And uh, in the COVID-19, we plan to be enrolling our patients uh, with COVID-19 or influenza-induced acute respiratory distress syndrome in October of this year. And again, uh, we're uh, enrolling clinical trial sites and people, um, MDs in particular, I would say, uh, could contact us about uh, becoming a clinical trial site. Um, you know, influenza, even though we have vaccines, even though we have antiviral drugs that are approved to treat influenza, we still have 50 to 150,000 people some years who die from influenza complications. And so um, our goal is to help those patients for whom existing therapies are, are not effective um, and uh, stop that lung damage and get them out of the hospital alive and get them home with intact uh, lung function. And we'll be enrolling in um, October of this year, we hope. So then how then would you compare this drug to others that may address ARDS, such as the recent finding with dexamethasone. Of course, this involves severe COVID-19 patients that required mechanical assistance breathing. But the point is, do you see other classes of medications and clinical trials that, are, that show promise? So um, what we can do in contrast to the dexamethasone that was used in trials like the recovery trial, where it's given daily for up to 10 days and it reduced mortality, we believe that we can reduce mortality to a greater extent and we can take that hospital stay down significantly, get those patients out of the hospital in three to four days with intact lung function. Whereas on that recovery trial, even though mortality was reduced, they still had that long, you know, lung attack and they're gonna face uh, the complications upon discharge. So there are, I think, 1,500 clinical trials uh, registered to treat COVID. And I would say uh, competitors to us really would be the chemotherapeutic approaches where they're gonna give patients chemotherapy to try to kill the infected monocytes and neutrophils that are damaging the lung. Chemotherapy has known toxicities, hair loss, diarrhea, nausea, vom I mean, horrific toxicities. 
we kill those infected cells off with very few side effects. And our side effects that have been observed in our compassionate use are very minor and actually medically manageable. So we, we, we really are not having reports of clinically significant side effects. So we can do what those chemotherapeutic agents can do without the toxicities. So then what would then be your perfect outcome with AV Biotech? And when would you anticipate that occurring? So our perfect outcome with our clinical trials uh, would be to you know, rapidly enroll and receive conditional approval uh, for commercial sales. And um, we would base that on 28-day mortality in our patients while we continue to follow them long-term. So get our drug out there on the market where we can be helping you know, as many patients as possible. And ultimately, uh, we, we want to partner uh, with uh, government or large pharma so that we can rapidly develop this drug and get it throughout the world. Our, our mission is to make sure that, that this life-saving medicine is available everywhere to everyone. And when we think about a transformation of medicine, we talk to MDs, particularly MDs who are active in developing countries where they, they don't have the medicines we do, they don't have the infrastructure, they can't undergo these cancer treatments because of the toxicities and the costs. These MDs say, your drug could transform how patients in developing countries are treated because they can be treated without those toxicities, without needing to dislocate themselves from their homes. And many of them don't have the financial needs. And so we really see this as trans transformative on a, a global scale, um, not only in cancer indications, but again, in identifying new viruses, getting the drug to the site of that virus and stopping it there before we get to the situation where we have a global economic lockdown and, and the mental and financial costs of this are enormous. And we're only beginning to see this. I, I think about children who've been masked and, and never seen an adult smile at them outside of their family. And the, the, the mental and psychologic costs of that, um, we need to open up this world, open up our smiles. And um, we believe our drug can help, help do that. So before I let you go today, is there any additional points that you would like to bring up before you go? So as a mother who lost my younger son to Burkitt's lymphoma on July 3rd of 2015, I have a passion. All of my colleagues at our company have a passion to um, get our drug out there so that no other parent has to hold their dying child if we can do something about it. And as we were naming our drug, uh, AVM is obviously for the company, and consultants told us just to pick a number, uh, AVM 001 or whatever. And we named our drug AVM 0703, uh, which is the day that my younger son died, um, to honor him, uh, honor his memory, and, and let the, the lessons that uh, Henry and I learned together uh, be used to help other people. And so uh, we uh, have a beautiful name for our drug and a, a beautiful mission and purpose in moving it forward. We are truly sorry for your loss, but thankful for the work that you're doing now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, we know you're busy and we're grateful that you joined us today. Thank you for having me on.